Hey guys, it's Will. It's Hong Kong Cinema Appreciation Society. Welcome back to the channel. If you are new here, welcome to the channel. Thank you so much for finding us. If you feel like subscribing, that would be awesome. It would be a huge help. Drop in the comments uh, what kind of movies you collect, what kind of movies you're into, what kind of videos you like to see from this channel. Give us a thumbs up and all that fun stuff. I want to get right into this video because I'm really excited about it. Oh, hell yeah. It's the Shotscope Volume 1 set. Everyone and their mother already has this. If you watch my video about me getting this, you'll know the story behind it and the fact that I just got it and why I just got it and the generosity of Flip Otaku for sending it to me as a gift on the eve of my birthday, which I don't even think he knew. So I watched King Boxer the day I got it because I couldn't help myself. Now, if you don't know, that's one of my all-time favorite Shaw Brothers films. I have the Dragon Dynasty DVD right here, which I have previously spoken about on this channel. That's like a top probably top five, honestly, personal favorite Shaw Brother film for me. I just love that film to death. Uh, and I'm going to talk in this video about why. So this video is really me revisiting King Boxer through the Shotscope set. This will not be a totally thorough, forensic, granular review of every single thing on the Blu-ray. One of the reasons is that there's about six and a half hours of bonus material, I think, or six hours of bonus material on this Blu-ray, if you count the commentary track. Because there's like four or four and a half hours of video bonus material, and then there's a commentary track. So there's just so much on here. Like, as I was going through it, I was like, is there a lock of Lola's hair in here too? Like, it's just like, it's almost obscene. Like, it's almost like a parody of a Blu-ray release. How much stuff is on here? I'm like, my God. Uh, I'm going to have to devote a week of my life to learning about King Boxer. So I did watch two of the interviews. I watched about an hour and a half worth of bonus material in addition to the film. So I want to show you where the film sits in the release. So here is the, that's the, the disc right there. And as you can see, King Boxer, this movie is also known as Five Fingers of Death. And then there's Lole and the whole cast of the film gathered around him. Uh, and... Um, uh, let me just read you everything that's on here, and then I'll kind of talk about the film itself and what it was like for me to revisit what is a personal favorite film of mine. Uh, brand new 2K restoration by Arrow Films from a 4K scan of the original negative. Let me just talk about that really quickly. Uh, you know, all the Shaw Brothers films open, obviously, with the Shaw logo and the music and stuff like that. So when the first shot of the film came on, I said, holy fuck, just like out loud to myself, it looks ridiculous. It looks so pristine and clean and incredible. Now, I will say, there's a lot of out-of-focus shots in this movie, which you really see in this super high-definition, really well-done remaster. And I'm going to interrupt myself for a second and tell you more about the bonus features in a second. So with one Arm Boxer, the Jimmy Wang Yu film, uh, which came out from Eureka and is also coming out from Arrow later in 2022 for the Region A people because the Eureka releases Region B. This is the Region A release, by the way. Um, but it's not any different from the Region B release. They're the same thing. There's just one is in the US and one is in the UK. So uh, when I watched One Arm Boxer, I noticed that there were a bunch of out-of-focus shots. And so I said in my review, did they not have focus pullers at the time? Like, it's interesting. It's just a lot of stuff that's out of focus. And John Krang, I don't know if you know who John Krang is. So John Krang is a martial artist, a stunt choreographer, a stunt performer. Um, John Krang was in The Master with Jet Li. He actually got kicked in the head by Jet Li. It's an amazing story. It's on the 88 films released in The Master. But uh, he has this really incredible knowledge of these films. He works with, like, Michael Wirth and Frank Zhang and, like, people like that on, on you know, documentaries about the history of, of kung fu films and martial arts films and stuff like that. John Krang got in the comments of my video and he said, uh, no, they did not have focus pullers at the time. That's why there's all those out of focus shots. So when you watch a film like this, this film is really well directed. And because of that, it has dynamic camera movements. It has tracking movements. It has zooms. It has complicated blocking within the space of the camera frame. And because of that, stuff goes out of focus. Because there's So if you don't know what a focus puller is, it's someone who literally whose job it is to focus the camera as it moves so that the, the primary people or objects that are in the frame are always in focus, right? So on these films, they didn't have focus pullers. So what they would do, I would assume, is they would focus the camera and then they would start the camera move. And as the camera moves, the depth of field is changing because the camera is moving in relationship to the objects and things get out of focus. And so you do see a lot of out of focus shots in this release. And one of the reasons you can see that so well is because it's such a pristine and well done release. So, uh, high definition 1080p Blu-ray presentation, newly restored, uncompressed Mandarin and English, original mono audio, 
Newly translated English subtitles for the Mandarin audio, plus English hard of hearing subtitles for the English dub, brand new commentary by David Desser, co-editor of The Cinema of Hong Kong and The Journal of Japanese and Korean Cinema, newly filmed appreciation by film critic and historian Tony Raines, so I did watch that and I'll talk about that. It's it's a phenomenal bonus feature. Interview with director Chung Chang Hua, whose name is also Zhang Chang Hua, that the Korean I think is Zhang Chang Hua, and the, the Cantonese adaptation of that, I guess is what you call this, Chung Chang Hua, filmed in 2003 and 2004 with Frederic Ambroise Scene. So that's, it's almost like a documentary about him putting together multiple interviews of him talking about his work with Shaw and stuff like that. Interview with star Wang Ping, filmed in 2007 by Frederic Ambroise Scene. Interview with Korean cinema expert Cho Young Jung, Cho Young Jung, author of um, Chung Chang Hua, Man of Action, filmed in 2005 with Frederick Ambrosin, Cinema Hong Kong Kung Fu, the first of a three-part documentary on Shaw Brothers' place within the martial arts genre, produced by Celestial Pictures in 2003, inter featuring interviews with Jackie Chan, Jet Li, John Woo, Samuel Hong, Gordon Liu, Lau Kar Lung, Cheng Pei Pei, David Chang, and others. I watched about half of that. It is mind-blowingly good. It's 50 minutes long, and it just it's just about like the history of uh, Hong Kong cinema and martial arts movies. And it's just like there's footage from all these Wong Fei Hung films and they go through like the whole history of it. It's just really incredible. It's really incredible. It's not just about Shaw Brothers. It says that it's about Shaw Brothers and they do talk a lot about Shaw Brothers, but they go into like those Wong Fei Hung films and all that other stuff, cafe and like, it's really incredible. Um, alternate opening credits from the American version, which is entitled Five Fingers of Death, Hong Kong, US and German theatrical trailers, plus US TV and radio spots and an image gallery. So something else that's worth noting about this film. This was released in Hong Kong in 1972. It came out in the United States in 1973. It came out before Enter the Dragon. And this is really the film that started the martial arts craze in the United States because it did well. It wasn't like Enter the Dragon was like this huge blockbuster hit, but this film did well. Like there were US radio spots, US TV spots. Like it was not like a, a thing that was just kind of here and there fly by night type of thing. Like it was a minor kind of hit on the grindhouse circuit in the US and it opened the floodgates for all those films. And so it's a really important film in the history of martial arts films, grindhouse cinema, Shaw Brothers, Hong Kong cinema, like all that stuff. Uh, and so it's a film that I, I think that just based on the quality of the film, everyone should see this movie. But based on its historical importance, it's also a film that everyone should see. Uh, so here's the where it is in the in the booklet, just to show that off to you as well. And it talks about like, the booklet just kind of contextualizes the film a little bit and talks about the music and stuff like that. So revisiting this film was really interesting to me because I don't think I've watched this in maybe three or four years. And in that time, I have learned so much about the history of Hong Kong cinema through doing this channel. And I've seen so many movies that my opinion of this film is really radically different in terms of where it's sat in the history of these films. Um, one thing that I noticed right away was the Jimmy Wang Yu influence, right? So Chinese Boxer, which I have right over here for the 88 films release, um, from Jimmy Wang Yu came out in 1970, and that was like a bare-handed fighting film, like martial arts, beating people up, like set in a realistic setting in the more in a more recent period in history that was not one of these like flying around long hair with swords fantasias. It was a grounded, realistic tale of revenge set in the not so distant past with people just beating the crap out of each other. But also Jimmy Wang Yu used a lot of filmmaking techniques to emphasize the visceral nature of the violence and the fighting, more so than trying to be realistic about martial arts. And this film is very much like a basher kind of film in the mold of the Jimmy Wang Yu film, where it's, you know, Lo Lei plays this character who's kind of quiet, he's reserved, but he's got a temper and he gets really pissed when he has to, and there's all these really bad bad guys, and it's barehanded fighting, and they're just beating the crap out of each other, and the emphasis on is, is really on using filmmaking techniques and, like, flying blood and, like, visceral hits to communicate the violence. And, and you really see that, but something that Tony Raines... So Tony Raines' bonus feature on here is phenomenal. And... It's 45 minutes long, and he contextualizes the film by starting at the very beginning of the history of Shaw. And he goes from, like, the very first oldest Shaw brother, who is not one of the ones who was involved in, in these films, starting out owning a cinema in Shanghai, and then how they went to Singapore, and how they ended up in Hong Kong, 
everything. Then he talks about Bruce Lee. It's like, let's take a detour to Golden Harvest. Let's talk about Bruce Lee. The impact of Bruce Lee, those barehanded fighting films, the violence, the impact. He doesn't talk about Jimmy Wang Yu. Uh, uh, Abrams, I forgot his first name, <laughs> Simon Abrams, in his liner notes, he does talk about Jimmy Wang Yu and, and the, the impact of Jimmy Wang Yu on this film. But you take Jimmy Wang Yu, you take Bruce Lee, you take the barehanded fighting, that kind of grindhouse aspect, that violence, that more realistic grounded setting those realistic revenge tales not set in some distant past right you put that together you get this film but what does this film offer beyond that that makes it not just a copycat because i really think this is a phenomenal film and tony Raines talks about why this film in a way differs this film has such great characters this is something i noticed the first time i saw it and as a screenwriter you know myself i would say i'm more of a writer than a screenwriter because i write in various mediums, but I, my background is in, I have a degree in screenwriting. I work with screenwriters. I read scripts for studios, for production companies, like professionally freelance. That's one of the things that I do for money. And I've read like thousands of scripts in my life. And just to give you the context of me talking about this from where I'm coming from, if, you're, if you haven't watched the channel before, obviously I talk about this a lot, but who knows, maybe there are people who've never seen my videos before. So just to let you know, that's where I'm coming from. Um, the, the the character relationships here are far more complicated and they're given far more depth than you usually get in these types of Shaw Brothers films. Um, you see characters alone. You see moments of regret, remorse, contemplation. There's a lot of stuff here about morality and regret and the way that people's lives evolve in ways they don't expect and how they deal with that and temptations that they are faced with and new pathways they could be taking. And there are so many moments of decision-making on the part of the character. Will I do this? Will I do that? How will that change the outcome of what's happening? And each section, there's all these factions of characters. There's like the main villain, and, and there's really kind of two main villains. And then they have like at least five henchmen who are all, all have agency. They all have their own scenes within the film. They're all taking action based on their own desires. And all of those actions change outcomes. And, and the Lole character really has two different teachers because he goes from one to the other. And he's got this woman who he's intended to be married to, but then he kind of has a romance with another woman. And it's and so there you, you're being presented with options for different alternate futures and what decisions will he make. And then you have... um characters who are his peers who in a more traditional martial arts film would just be there say a line go away but in this film they have agency you see them on their own there's one scene where this other guy who's kind of like at Lole's level as a martial artist kind of like a senior student in this martial arts school he goes and drinks on his own and he and then he runs into another character who knows the Lole character and they talk about him and he makes decisions active decisions that affect the trajectory of the plot and it's this very high level filmmaking and one of the things that tony Raines talks about in his interview or his kind of appreciation of the film is that jong chang hua was used to making movies in korea and and when he was making movies in korea it wasn't this industrial process of like here's this, 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 go make it, it's done, right? And apparently he got really mad at one point at Shaw Brothers because the, I, I, if I remember the story correctly, he was making a film and they had to take a break for like a couple days to, to for a set to be finished because they were still building it. And when he came back to set, he had a different cinematographer and he was like, what the hell? And they're like, oh, we couldn't let that guy sit around doing nothing. We sent him off to another movie. And he was like, like what like we spent all this time figuring out the look of this film and you just send him away but at Shaw Brothers that's what they would do everyone was interchangeable where obviously Zhang Chang Hua is coming from this place of a, a team of people deliberately creates the aesthetic and trajectory and uh, the complete package of a film and then they go from beginning to end and make that film and they make a meaningful piece of work together he left Shaw Brothers I believe after this film, because he was like, fuck it, I'm done. I can't be a part of this system anymore. And then he went, I think he went to Golden Harvest and Raymond Chow stole them away, right? And actually something else that Tony Raines talks about is the rivalry between Run Run Shaw, Run Mei Shaw, Mona Fong, like those people, and Raymond Chow for leaving and kind of having better business instincts than them. And, you know, finding Bruce Lee and all this stuff and then being like, Aah! like wanting to make films to compete with that. And this was one of those films that they made to compete with that. But um, I just and the way that the fight scenes unfold, right? It's not always just like hero versus villain, hero versus villain. It's like 
henchmen versus secondary hero and why are those two fighting and what is their specific conflict not just about the overall kind of trajectory of the film but why do those two people in particular have a conflict and like multiple characters in this film change allegiances throughout the film and that changes the trajectory of the film too and you know there's just so many unexpected moments where in a more traditional Shaw Brothers film from uh, that was more just part of their factory system, they would not have these subtleties and this intelligence and these unexpected outcomes. And the, th the thing that I really thought of while I was watching this film, the narrative template of this movie, really reminded me of heroic bloodshed films where you have like the low lay character really kind of reminds me of like a Chow Yun Fat character or like, you know, maybe like an Andy Lau character, someone like it because he's, he's, he's kind of reserved... He, and Tony Long is another one, actually. Like, you know how Tony Long has that quiet thing where he articulates everything through his eyes, but he doesn't always talk a ton? Lole kind of reminds me of that. He's got that intensity in his eyes. And on his face, you can see his internal process. He's very good at articulating his thought process through his face. And I think Chow Yun-Fat is very, very good at that too. But you have this hero who's a, who's a good person, is a genuinely good person, but has a temper and gets involved in bad circumstances and just has to whoop the shit out of people, right? And you see that a lot in these heroic bloodshed films, but heroic bloodshed films also tend to have not just like hero bad guy character relationships. There are these sprawling kind of films. If you look at Ringo Lamb, if you look at John Woo, a film like A Better Tomorrow, you have Leslie Chung, Tin Long, Wai Se Lee, Chow Yun Fat, right there's like kind of four lead characters and they all have their own different relationships with each other and with other people in the film and they all evolve in different ways and their decision making process affects the outcome of the film and how the plot moves forward and wild search i think is maybe like the ultimate example of a character driven heroic bloodshed film where the decisions of the characters wholly tr predict the trajectory of the film and there's no plot machinations really happening there at all um but I think in a way, King Boxer is a predictor of where the narrative of Hong Kong cinema will go in the next decade. I mean, like 12 years later, A Better Tomorrow came out, or 14 years later, excuse me, because 86 versus 72 for this film. Um, but it was just such an interesting movie to revisit. It looks so good in this set. The bonus fe features on here, like I said, that Tony Raines thing was mind blowing and I loved it and it was incredible. And I'm so excited to check out more Tony Raines stuff on the other releases that he's been on recently. Um, uh, the the documentary about with, with Jackie and Jet Li and John Woo and Sam Hong and all those people talking about these films and the interviews with the director, Zhang Cheng Hua. I'm just, I'm gonna look at my notes here to make sure I'm not leaving anything out, but I think it's a pretty good overview because this is not supposed to be a super, super granular in-depth review, like I said, but really just an appreciation of me revisiting visiting a DVD again, what is one of my personal favorite Shaw Brothers films that I just love, 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 love. It's King Boxer. It's Five Fingers of Death. Again, shout out to Flip Otaku for sending me that set. I've gotten so much joy out of it already, and I've only watched one movie. I mean, it's like a Monty Python sketch, how much bonus material is on here. It's absurd. I don't know how I'm going to get through it all, but I'm going to try. So I'm thinking that moving forward with this set, this will kind of be my template of videos. I'll watch the film. I'll kind of peruse the bonus features. I'll, I'll watch select things, and then I'll come back and talk to you about them. My name is Will. It's Hong Kong Cinema Appreciation Society. As always, I do thank you so, so much for watching, and we will see you next time. Ha <laughs>